officially call the meeting to order. Um, so just a little background on uh, CIFOC. Uh, CIFOC is the Strategic Initiatives and Financial Oversight Committee for the City of Framingham. Uh, this committee was created by the charter process that went through to uh, have Framingham become a city. Um, and there are three uh, appointing authorities for this committee. Uh, the mayor appoints three appointees, the school committee appoints three appointees, and the city council appoints three. And then it is um, uh, the nine of us that make up the committee. Um, I will add uh, up front that uh, the CIFOC committee um, doesn't have a ton uh, or actually any authority uh, to do anything. We are more a sounding board. We are uh, a committee that, uh, uh, due to our professional experience and our background and other involvement that we have had in the government in the past, um, we are uh, able to um, provide input and significant input to the three appointing authorities that uh, uh, appointed us um, to uh, work in consultation with them and uh, in particular with the mayor uh, who is responsible for creating the strategic plan. Uh, it's a 10-year strategic plan that is due uh, next year uh, and she will be bringing that forth uh, to the City Council. Um, the CIFOC produces its own independent annual report uh, that it presents to the three appointing authorities uh, as well. Uh, and that uh, it is our goal that that annual report will be what we turn over to the mayor with our recommendations uh, for the future. So uh, I will just quickly go through introductions uh, for everyone. Uh, again, my name is Robert Case. I am the chair of the CIFOC committee. Um, on the end, I'll start at this end, we have Mahmoud Akhtar. Um, and then next to him, we have Jerry Desolets. Uh, we Joel Francis, Mary Kate Feeney. Uh, David Kicklis, uh, James Colhane, and Darlene Yumina. Um, uh, Mike Gatlin is also a member of this committee. He apologizes for not being able to attend tonight. He had something come up, uh, and he is not able to be here tonight. Um, but he is also uh, a very valued member of this uh, committee. So tonight's meeting is for you to share your ideas uh, with the CIFOC committee. We have uh, some topics that we would like to we'll start the discussion off with, but this is more of a town hall style meeting. Um, and so instead of us really presenting to you, we want you to present to us. We want you to share your thoughts, your ideas, if you know things that other cities may do or other ideas that you may have that you think would benefit Framingham in the next 10 years, please, uh, we have microphones at the end of each aisle that you can go and you uh, can, can speak. Um, everyone, each person will have three minutes uh, to speak. If your comments are longer than three minutes, um, then you can always submit those to the CIFOC committee in writing. Uh, and then we will put those into the official record. Um, and then you can also, um, if we go through the room and, and everyone's had a chance to speak and someone would like to speak again, then, then we can do that as well. That happened uh, often at the, the last hearing a couple weeks ago. So. Um, that is kind of uh, where we will go. Um, so tonight's meeting, we're gonna focus on the four topics of education, public safety, transportation or traffic, and the environment and sustainability. Um, so I think, um, do any of the other committee members have anything they'd like to add? I'll just check quickly. Nope, okay. So let's start with the topic of education. Um, uh, in, so far, we have received uh, reports from the superintendent of schools, Dr. Tremblay, who actually just joined us. Thank you, sir. Um, so, uh, and we, he was actually the very first person we met with uh, as a committee. Uh, so I was, uh, other than our inaugural meeting, and uh, which I was very happy to have him in and to hear his thoughts about the future of education in our city. Um, so one of the, uh, I guess, the overarching themes that we heard was uh, a possibility of early childhood education in Framingham and what that might look like. Um, I know that uh, the superintendent is doing 
uh, some research into that currently. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, having his research and finding out what that uh, data finds. Um, but um, uh, it's, there's several different ways that that could look. Um, but I'm interested to, uh, and I believe the committee is interested to see if anyone has any specific comments on the education. Um, but the floor is open, so uh, if anyone would like to step up and speak, please do. Um, and we are here to listen. Anyone? All right. Oh, we got... Uh, okay, sure. Uh, could you please just identify yourself just so we have your name on the record? Jerry Bloomfield, District 1. Um, Framingham has long been known for its educational uh, efforts and its desire to achieve, um, and that has been undertaken by the uh, residents of Framingham at great cost to them, and um, things don't get better things, no matter how much we contribute to the effort, it seems as though the problems are just getting larger and more difficult by the day. And there's not enough money, in my opinion, to effectively deal with all the issues uh, in a way that people will actually feel and see an abundance of improvement. And at our last meeting, which you allowed me to speak, and I appreciated that, uh, affordability was one of my key elements that I was speaking about and it's always a governing factor as to how much you can do and when and that's just the reality of life in Framingham these days so I think it's a, a requirement that the school department over time uh, even though they've been given a lot of time to put the pieces together in a comprehensive way to show uh, CIFOC, for example, uh, a way that they believe is doable and indicate the metrics and the guidelines by which they'll be measured and to uh, aid in assisting as to how that could possibly be affordable. So it just can't be putting out a wish list. It has to be a wish list that actually gets things done in a time frame that's necessary in a way that's affordable for the taxpayers of Framingham. And I'll just end this piece by saying, uh, we've been able to rely on the industrial commercial sector in the past uh, to pay uh, an uh, out of proportion amount of the taxes and the uh, residents have been uh, appreciative of that. But because of factors beyond anybody's control as it seems today, the uh, commercial industrial sector is under pressure and it looks like we're going to see a greater and greater shift to the residential taxpayer, which just complicates things. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. Mr. Epstein, I believe you were next. Okay, uh, Jeff Epstein from the School Committee. And first of all, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, the way for the school committee to input to the CIFOC would be also best done with our reps coming to the school committee meeting and having a bit of a chat. But it seems to me this is the first opportunity to really uh, input. Uh, one thing is that uh, the school department has a strategic plan. It drives the budget and uh, things are on the improve uh, trajectory. Uh, it's very different from the city side which a strategic plan is is trying to get developed here with this initial input. But it's a different process because inside the school department, the, the whole thing was driven by the, our CEO, which is the superintendent. So I think the challenge of CIFOC is to try to get this accepted on the city side. So it's, it's not like you uh, did the process with Bob getting together all his department heads and them all developing it. So it's kind of a bit of a challenge. I went through uh, something like this in Newton at one point and it was very difficult to get the school uh, schools to uh, execute on their strategic plan because the superintendent was never engaged on it. So that's one, one thing. I, I'm just going to write down or just input a list of problems that I see and on, edu on education. I'll come back to sustainability when we deal with that. 
One thing that we ran into with as a problem was alignment of contract agreements with budget planning. When we had a contract with various COLAs in the years, there was one in the last budget cycle, which was three and a half. When you have a three and a half percent increase on salaries, it means your budget's got to increase approximately by that amount because uh, salaries are 80 percent. So we were very surprised to find out an initial 2% increase suggested for the schools, and we had to battle a lot about that. So I think when we're doing contract agreements, there has to be better integration of the city side financial planners with the actual contracts. And when a vote is provided or it's okayed by the city to have a three and a half cola, that has to be followed through on the, on the city side. So it's better communications. I think that has to be consistent. So the other thing that was a confusion was the rate at which the school department budget is growing. And it is a large budget and it grows at, at uh, a significant amount, but it grew $50 million in 10 years, which sounds like a lot, which is about a 4% increase per year. But that's not what the taxpayers pay. When you look at it, the taxpayers pay an annual increase of about 2%. And I think that was not well understood and still probably not widely known. To go to a different area, building, building management, we're clearly not keeping up with building maintenance. And so what I think SIFOC might happily do is estimate what the backlog is, whether it's increasing and how you finance it. Uh, that probably also applies to roads, but I'm just talking about schools here. The other thing is student population. We have demographics on that. But I think it's really important for us to track developments here and see how many students are being generated by the developments. Uh, Hopkinton got a big surprise where they found many more students were generated than the developer thought. So that's something that I think you folks can look at and input uh, in an objective fashion. Uh, further, there's one thing that threatens the schools and that is uh, money and uh, tax rates and all this kind of stuff. The, important thing here, and it's the second last thing I'll say, is seniors currently have a cap of $40,000, uh, um, which if that's their income or below, they can completely defer property taxes if they're seniors. Okay, that's a state thing. Now, you can do a home rule petition where as a city, or possibly as a town as well, but I know cities have done this, where you can raise that cap. So you can relieve the tax threat uh, to seniors by raising it to $60,000 or as one other city has done to $86,000. At the moment we have 15 seniors who are taking advantage of that uh, program. And so what, what is happening every time people worry, worry about the tax rate, should we tax to two, tax to two and a half, they say well we don't want to tax the seniors out of the city. Okay? And it's a genuine thing but if we raise that limit we would give them a lot of release so they wouldn't have to pay taxes at all. Uh, if we raise it to 60, so that it's not such a threat. So I think the SIFOC might look at that and see what the numbers would look like if we raised that, and uh, that would help us. The final thing is school buildings. It's clear that all the students are on the north side, or uh, on the south side, and the buildings largely are on the north side, and that's been talked about for a long time. And that means that you have to ha build some schools on the south side. The obvious property is Bethany. There's also Sons and Mary. So it might be useful if the if the uh, uh, CIFOC could pronounce on a strategy that they think might be useful for that because uh, when I was in Newton, it took three or four years to convince the mayor to buy Aquinas College, okay, which uh, we wanted to buy because it was a 40B development threat for us and would bring in a lot of students and overwhelm the local schools and their neighborhood schools there. But still, we need to get it so the students, uh, we've got a thousand students in the draw area of Wilson and so many of them have to be bused. And so it's a big inequity to have students from the south side on buses for such long trips. So I think it's something you might consider uh, there. So that's all I have to say on the schools. <laughs> I have two other things on solar. Thank you. Anyone else? Any committee members like to make any comments on education or I just want to give anybody a chance to talk? I know part of the, uh, the early education uh, program uh, that was discussed was uh, a greater uh, opportunity to work with uh, FSU because we have such a great uh, institution here in, in the middle of in our city. 
uh, and uh, it, it's a, an opportunity to reach out uh, to work with the, uh, the graduates and the uh, uh, people of that program to, to kind of uh, help us a little bit more uh, with this early childhood program, and it's a chance to have um, that, you know, that partnership there, uh, which I think uh, I was, uh, or I am very interested in, in uh, learning more about that and how that could uh, work towards uh, us gaining that, um, making this a reality in Framingham and what that would look like. Um, so obviously I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, anyone else? Mr. Bloomfield? I don't think uh, 30 years ago in Framingham, there were a lot of people like you're willing to do that would want to think here we are today and state where we are and where we should be going and be able to capture all those elements. Uh, it's a major challenge. Uh, but just to give you that degree of difficulty, to uh, imagine Framingham in 30 years, uh, now 70,000 people, going to be 100,000 people. Um, and if that were to happen, and there's a good likelihood it will, um, what would have to be in place and how would we get there and gets again back to my subject of affordability, but I don't want to dwell on that. I just want to say that, that if you do a nuclear family of 3.7 people per family and you increase the population by 30,000 people, you're going to have to come up with 8,000 types of residents, whether it's apartments, condos, houses. Uh, and, and that's what you should do if you believe that we should have 30,000 more people in Framingham, that we could actually uh, have an infrastructure and a basis to accommodate that, which would be uh, monumental to begin with. But just to connect it to education, uh, that would mean you'd have 2,000 more students just with the new population. Uh, and that would involve a lot of schools and a lot of places. And today we're at $18,000 or thereabouts cost per student per year. So add 2,000 and you're adding megabucks to a budget. And somehow I hope you can get from where we are now to state the condition relative to education and all the things that will affect it out over time. But first I think you have to grapple with, should we have 100,000 people in Framingham and could we ever get there in a practical, organized kind of way without changing the entire way we do things in Framingham? That, that'd be like, uh, what's that? Uh, I can't think of it right now. There's a, there's, a, there's a phrase that when you take a concept and completely change it, you oxy, not oxymoron, you, uh, never mind. There's something uh, that changes where you'd have to say almost what would life be like in 2050? How would people be living? And how should you plan for whatever that is? And that's a moving thing and it's a changing thing because if you think back 30 years ago, we didn't have smartphones and a host of other things. So all those mm -hmm. things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, pass the mic down to Mr. Griffin. Great, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the comments of Mr. Epstein in particular on the issue of apartment uh, and other residential development in Framingham and whether or not the planning department and planning board have really done an appropriate assessment of the impact on our schools. I think the answer to that is no. You know, within maybe a two square mile area of my house, we have recently had 2,000 apartments built. And there's going to be a tremendous impact on our schools. And I understand that uh, while there have been maybe some little discussions around that in terms of the planning functions within the city of Framingham, there's been no genuine assessment to uh, assess the impact of that financially and on quality of life issues including traffic and other things. So I think um, there's a burden on us, I think, too, as we work with the city administration on these issues to make sure that we begin to do appropriate analysis of these things before the decisions are made. The, you know, the horse is out of the barn on the couple thousand apartments that have just been built, but there are probably a bunch of others in the queue. And I think we need to stop and think very serious, seriously about those before the city goes ahead on those. And it's a message that perhaps this committee could send to the mayor or the city council 
uh, the schools obviously hearing that, and uh, then of course the city department heads as they review these questions because uh, uh, <coughs> the, the plans and specs and uh, building plans and uh, plot plans for the understanding those are all fine and well, but if you really don't do an assessment of the impact of those populations on our community, uh, we're missing an opportunity to do some careful and thoughtful planning there. So I uh, appreciate the remarks of several speakers on that issue. When I was born in Framingham, there were 25,000 people here. I won't tell you when that was, but uh, it wasn't all that long ago. So we've seen significant growth, and you know, there, there are a lot of great uh, positive aspects around that. But when we're talking growth and whether we'll get to 100,000 or not, I'm assuming that we will, but let's do it in a thoughtful, planful way, uh, which I think, and it's not anybody's fault, I think one of the, one of the part of the impetus be, behind uh, creating city form of government was to centralize decision making and authority over these kinds of things so that thoughtful, well-educated decisions could be made around these issues that impact all of us. And so uh, just a comment to uh, thanks, thank the audience members for bringing up these challenging issues for the committee. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, is there any more discussion that anyone would like to have on any topic with education? Things you may have seen in other cities and towns, programs, yes. Okay, sure. And that is, when you do the numbers, and it's very simple uh, to see what the uh, school budget was and how the taxpayer-funded portion of it increased over the last 10 years, you can see that it went up 2% a year, which is about inflation. But I didn't say that the student population was increasing in that time. So it increased at 1.4% a year. So the actual cost to educate a student increased at 0.7% a year. So in terms of bang for your buck, the school department has been doing a remarkable job. Now we're assisted by the state with Chapter 70 funds that help us do that, but in many ways the cost that the schools, um, the burden they put on the taxpayers is quite low given the number of students uh, increasing. So. The schools, through their Chapter 70 assistance from the state, have lightened the burden on the, on the city. And in the last five years, the city and town taxed below the 2.5% levy limit and accumulated a total of $60 million of relief for property tax owners. In other words, we would have $60 million more in the city coffers if we taxed to 25 So. That's another factor that's not well known. And I know that there are other issues that affect the tax bills, and that is water rates are high and we didn't uh, invest in infrastructure. And all of these things I see as threatening the school system when we don't invest in infrastructure properly. Because ultimately you have gotta find the money from somewhere. So it concerns me that we're just addressing stormwater now whereas other cities and towns started looking at it in 2006 and put together enterprise funds to deal with that. So the way the city manages these long-term strategic things affects the school department, and I'm just arguing that case right now in terms of money available. So it's really, really important to do infrastructure investment, not just stormwater, which we're just dealing with, but when I hear that the backlog of road maintenance is going up, and there's some roads we've just given up on, then the dollar that you put in prevention now and the four dollars you have to pay later when you don't affects the schools a lot. So I think the overarching uh, thing here for SIFOC is to look at that whole picture because we're all in the same boat. And of course it's not just the schools, but it's the fire department and the police department, DPW all suffer from a lack of long range planning. So I really appreciate your effort. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Uh, why don't we move on to the next topic of uh, public safety? Um, I know public safety is, of course, um, usually on the minds of everyone uh, because as we live in cities and more and more people live into cities, they expect to be safe and they expect to uh, 
be able to uh, have a good quality of life as a result of that. Um, and I know that in the past, I think it's been mentioned to us uh, that you know we have staffing issues at, the, at our police department. Um, there are other, there are national trends that uh, people going into the enforcement field is they are down, um, which is understandable. It's a highly scrutinized job. It's a very stressful job, a very dangerous job. Um, and so there are reasons for this. Um, but part of what our thinking needs to be is how do we overcome that? And uh, uh, is there something that we can do as a city? So um, that's just to kind of get us started and kicked off. If anybody has any comments on public safety or any ideas or thoughts, um, the floor is open. Mr. Bloomfield. Public safety is at, right at the top of criteria for quality of life uh, measurements and assessments. Um, if you look at the neighborhood and community portion of the 10-year uh, census and the work they do afterwards, gets into the subjects of which are the most important quality of life criteria. And, and Framingham in particular, during our current set of circumstances, of which some of which was mentioned at the uh, September 23rd site block open meeting uh, was the fact that the merchants downtown have to go off and acquire a private police detail to be able to protect their customers and themselves from a host of issues, uh, social issues and so on and so forth. Uh, so you have that piece and then you have the people within their neighborhoods that don't feel safe in certain parts of our city uh, and then you have the police department that uh, is trying to do a good job. Uh, they are there to protect and serve and sworn officers that aren't getting the kind of support that they need. Now, not all this is necessarily the responsibility of, or uh, something the sidewalk needs to be concerned with, uh, but you should be aware of it as your starting off point so you can state the condition of where we are now and if you're going to be talking with the mayor and the city council and the school department, then some of these things should be stakes in the ground that should be topics for discussion so that we can correct these problems. Uh, the public health area, I consider as part of public safety. So, and that's been stressed to the point of uh, them doing a miraculous job without the resources and something like triple E that's come up, or vaping, or marijuana, none of that was budgeted for. And, uh, and if that were condition were to go on, and we already lived through it with the opioid crisis, and we didn't pay enough attention to that until after it was an epidemic. And the same thing with vaping. We, I think we were in a better position to nip that in the bud. But there needs to be a much greater effort in, in public health and public safety in order to have a successful community. And that's what we all want. We want to have an excellent, successful community. And those are criteria that should be as high up, from my perspective, as education. Uh, and without getting into a back and forth about where resources are being spent and money is being spent fairly, fairly and adequately, uh, again, that's a totally different subject, they should be on par. Uh, those things should be the basic elements of uh, a well-balanced and a successful community uh, along with education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Committee members? Comments? Oh. Here. I think a lot of our I don't want to say silence, but we're nodding and agreeing and many of these issues that you guys have already brought up. We've also heard from council and we also personally firmly believe are important issues facing our city. So it's great to hear all of you reinforce that so that we can also push it and know that it's as important to all of you as it is to us. So I just wanted to mention that. And backing up a little bit to Jeff's comment, sorry, no, we're not in school anymore, but um, we have discussed the best way for 
the school council appointees to meet with you guys. Um, it's been something that's come up in our meetings and we were hashing it out. There's a little bit of discrepancy on what we think the best approach is, but we're working on that. All right. Well, we can always come back if we need to, if anybody needs to, to think of something. But um, the next topic is always a very <laughs> well-versed topic for Framingham, which is traffic and transportation and uh, th things we can do to relieve uh, the situation of the, the current traffic uh, here in Framingham. Uh, how we can uh, uh, make Framingham more friendly for all modes of transportation uh, to make sure that uh, residents, again, have a high quality of life. They're able to uh, uh, traverse across our city in many different ways uh, safely uh, and as well as being uh, friendly to the environment as well. Um, so I am... Uh, Happy to open the floor for traffic discussions of, of anything of any nature like that. Um, uh, yeah, anybody? Comments? Mr. Bloom. Uh, oh, let's go back to her first. We'll give somebody else a chance. No problem, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Amy Puelka. Um, just a couple off-the-cuff thoughts about transportation. Mm -hmm. um, I think transportation is going to change a lot in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, I think we're at the, the point we were at with technology and communications 15 years ago. Um, and the reason I'm optimistic is because, well, in my mind, optimistic, um, that the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states are working on a regional collaboration for a cap and trade program for transportation. And they are looking at um, capping the emissions from transportation and using the proceeds to invest in resiliency and infrastructure projects um, throughout their communities. And things like electric vehicle infrastructure is gonna, I think, change a lot in our state. We're already seeing that with uh, the utilities, Eversource and National Grid taking proactive steps to install those. I know Framingham is working on a, a electric vehicle charging station. Um, so I just wanted to say that the, the transportation is gonna change a lot. So interweaving that into whatever pieces you're looking at, whether it's the backlog of road repairs, the school bus challenges that are happening this year, um, or, um, projects that are coming up. I think if we can stay on top of that, we'll be in a good place. Thank you. Mr. Bloomfield. Dr. Casey, we can say it. Traffic stinks. And everybody knows it. And uh, unless we're going to have everybody working from home, um, that's just one piece of it, but then you have to deal with commerce. They need trucks, and for those people that can't work at home, they gotta be uh, finding a way to get into the larger work centers like Boston and Worcester. We happen to be in the middle of those two large workspaces, uh, and Framingham is just the place to send a train through. Uh, and what it does is it messes up the entire traffic in the downtown area which already has an abundance of problems that they're having a hard time dealing with. Uh, and for us to add additional housing units into that and some other things which has already been discussed is, is, is working in the wrong, it's like working against ourselves. Um, I remember when Tim Murray uh, came before the selectmen maybe 10 or 12 years ago along with uh, Mr. Mahoney from the then uh, Department of Transportation under the Deval Patrick administration and uh, they did their dog and pony show and they wanted to increase train traffic through the center of Framingham and everybody stood up and applauded. But they didn't take into consideration the people that live in that area and the things they need to deal with. 
and whether or not they can continue to deal with those things along with everything else that's happening in that densely uh, out of town city. Uh, and what they want to do now is they want to capture uh, Springfield and, and, and that traffic and bring them east uh, through Worcester and then into Boston. And again, Framingham, you know, when we went to the city charter, uh, one of the big uh, selling points was, well, we'll have a seat with all the other mayors and all the other larger communities uh, that will give us more voice and uh, the, the state will pay greater attention to us. And that was one of the justifications for going from a nice town to a nice city. Uh, but it's not happening in this go-round because they're already talking about increasing the train traffic. And for as long as I have lived here, they've been talking about the traffic impact downtown 126, 135, with no clear statement if they're ever going to be able to do anything about that. But they're talking about, and they're going to start twisting people's arms to, imp to approve the added train traffic. So you, you're saying we're concerned about traffic, but are you really concerned? I'm not saying you folks. Uh, the city's saying we're concerned about traffic, but I'm not sure they really are. Uh, again, getting back to the criteria, the main element of the whole criteria is which communities have succeeded from a li livability uh, criteria, and those are the kind of cities that people want to live in. So until we tackle this problem, find a way to do it, our existing traffic commission uh, doesn't have the horsepower necessary to resolve the issues. What you need there is the uh, chairperson of the city council and you need the mayor to sit on that commission. So when people bring forward from their areas that they live in what their concerns and what their complaints are, that something actually happens as opposed to maybe never. Uh, and what you do is people begin to say, hey, I don't want to talk about that anymore, but we all know about it. And it's one of those things we don't want to really talk about anymore because nothing ever gets done. Um, so this is a prime opportunity for, uh, from my perspective, for Sidewalk to say, we believe this is one of the primary elements of concern. Uh, we may be in a position to project where we'd like it to go. And either you folks at uh, City Hall tell us what the initiatives are to get there and tell us where the funds are coming from so we can approve it and monitor it and go on forward with it, or else you kind of say, well, we're not sure what we're doing. And that's what needs to be told to the people of Framingham, that people have looked at it and given it an, an, uh, an effort to understand it and consider it, but they still haven't been able to tackle it. At least they know. Uh, that for their own condition, if they want to stay in this city or not, uh, given I wouldn't want to live downtown just for the traffic or along Route 9 or the marijuana shops oh. or all the other stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hold on. Uh, Mary Kate asks first. Uh, thank you very much. Um, th the thing is, uh, Framingham has been arguing about the train tracks downtown and what to do about it since the 1880s. So we haven't been able to come up with an answer on this in more than 100 years. So I, I hear you, but also traffic and transportation affects every inch of our lives here in Framingham. So what I'm interested in as a CIFOC member is looking at what is that next 10-year plan? What is it that we can report back to those who are going to come up with that strategic plan about being innovative and looking for what new investments in public transportation can we make? I mean, we do have, you know, that, that train track is very important for us here in Framingham. We are a commuting community and we have all those new apartments that are in the transit orient de development that depend on the train running more often than it does with more cars than it does. So, and the other thing is we have a bus system, but how can we help make that bus system more vibrant? How do we interview, uh, we were supposed to have a bike share program this year. How do we get that activated so that it's part of that? I do believe the transportation, you are correct, ma'am, that uh, transportation is going to change a lot in the next decade. So we need to think ahead. Uh, what is that going to look like? And how do we here in Framingham capture what other communities are doing already and they take for granted that we're not doing here? So I would love to hear anything from other members here tonight and from the wider community. What is it that we aren't doing? What is it that 10 years from now we should be taking for granted like our neighbors are already taking for granted? Um, Again, Jerry, I hear you about downtown traffic, but how is it that we can alleviate traffic? I don't think the answer is limiting the amount of trains. Um, 
one thing about the trains I think should be pointed out. Framingham, from what I understand, is the only town that has two at grain crossings on the entire Worcester line. Ashland has one. Um, if they're looking to increase the trains, I think there's an argument to be made that the tracks around Framingham get put below grade. And there's enough space to, put a th to build the tracks without, to build one at a time effectively without closing it. So that you end up with three tracks going through the station below grade. That's the solution I think that we should be looking for as a sidewalk to state. That's just my position going forward. It solves, it solves the, it doesn't solve the downtown traffic, but it solves the crossing issue. It does make it safer. And, and, and I think the quid pro quo is then, then MDOT can put more trains through it because they're not going to have a hassle because they'll have tracks that don't, that, that don't um, run and cross over with roads. And again, we seem to be the only town that has at grade crossings and the Worcester line currently is by far the largest train ridership as what MDOT told us a couple of months ago. So let me add one more thing. Clearly, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, some of the things like the tracks are not going to happen overnight, but there are also other ideas that might make things, you know, low-hanging fruit, right? Small ideas, small changes that we can do that might make the, our life a little bit better. So we're open for ideas, uh, you know, there are things that can be done for a short amount of money in a, in a short period of time that, that may not solve the macro issues, but certainly could solve some of the micro ones in neighborhoods or on busy, our busy cross streets. So just, just bear in mind, this topic has gone round and round with this group for, for since we started meeting. And, and as, M, as MK said, you know, if you go onto the website, you can actually find the plans, I think, from the early 1900s about the grade crossing. So. If it was very simple, it would have been solved. I, I do think there might be some room now to maneuver and have someone else help us pay for it. Ms. Stimson? Yep. Can someone hand her the microphone? Yep. yep. I'm her assistant. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, Karen Dempsey, and I have a question or a comment. Um, speaking about, because we do have a pretty active and getting more active uh, bus, bus line here, the MWRTA. And is that something currently that the city is working with them? I'm sure they've got long, short range and long range plans. Um, so I didn't know if that's something, maybe just a, uh, a comment question, I don't know if you guys know that now, but reaching out and working with them and having some type of um, ongoing regular meetings with EDCAR uh, and the administration at the MWRTA to see what their thoughts are about transportation and, you know, because they're a big part of as we move forward with all of this as well. So just a, a question, comment, I don't know, and hopefully um, that, that can be done as well and, you know, to let the mayor and the council know if they're not, you know, if they could do that and, and have another, maybe another committee <laughs> or something, another group to, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Desolate. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Dempsey. That's a great uh, comment. Uh, the MWRTA RTA was, uh, it has been in existence for a long time, but we have in the leadership of Senator Karen Spilka, who, as you know, is now the Senate president, done tremendous expansion of its work here in Framingham, but in particular in Metro West overall. And I think it's a great opportunity for us, for the mayor, uh, perhaps for the Senate president, for the RTA, and particularly the city planning office, to sit together and come up with, and I think someone's point over here was well taken too, while we're probably not going to stop the trains from coming through town, can we work on the schedules? Can we look at a third track? In, with the person of the Senate president now representing the city of Framingham and with the mayor perhaps paying attention to this issue, we can at least get at that table of the decision makers in the city of Boston and in the state house and in the executive branch of government uh, to get at the table with those folks to do some planning. But we have some work of our own to do here first and I think uh, it would be a challenge for the mayor and the city planning department to get together uh, to work with the Metro West Regional Transit Authority and the um, MTA to come up with a plan that makes 
uh, to at least ameliorates the challenges for us, the traffic uh, of the train tracks and other, and the regional transportation bus system. Another comment well taken um, from Mr. Bloomfield is the Traffic Commission, and you know, bless their hearts for sitting and listening to a lot of neighborhood concerns and complaints, and I feel for them in the sense that I don't think they have the tools and the resources they should have to make appropriate decision making. Uh, they have no budget. I think that sometimes as I watch those meetings, they have uh, very little attention paid to them by the other branches of city government, including the police department and the city planning office. All of those people should be a party to those discussions of neighborhood uh, traffic disasters. Uh, and that's not happening. So they're a little bit, the traffic commission operating in a vacuum without the resources, and so they're unable to make the decisions uh, and to put those decisions, to execute those decisions as they're made. And so it's a bit of a toothless tiger right now in terms of the traffic commission. And I think if we want to begin resolving some of the traffic issues in our neighborhoods, we need to give them the resources to do that. And uh, people on the city council in the mayor's office need to pay attention to it and understand that these are quality of life issues greatly impacting most of the neighborhoods of Framingham. So it's, uh, it's something as we look in our longer term recommendations, if we're gonna have a traffic commission, we should make it for real. Thanks. I just wanna give some, Mr. Desolis makes a great pot, um, comment about the traffic commission that it does need the resources and I'm sure we'll convey that as well in our when we put our report together, but well, just a little food for thought for people to think about. This is gonna be a 10 year plan, and in the next 10 years, um, I hope people know about this, the Mass Pike project that's gonna take place in, starting in uh, uh, 2022. Um, and that's gonna be a decade long project. So this plan is gonna coincide with this. Um, so we need to think about, because we're going to be greatly affected about by this, it's going to come down to one lane and one track to get in and out of Boston. It sounds like a nightmare. Uh, it is going to be a nightmare. Uh, the end result, we'll love, um, but we have to think about how that's going to affect us here in Framingham. It's going to be great. So just something else to just think about. Thank you. Anyone else in the public about, to oh, sure. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Amy Finstein. I'm in District 5. Um, I had a couple things that, forgive me, referencing my notes. Um, first, um, I will echo the comments that were already made about the train tracks. We don't need to rehash it, but I will say, um, as somebody who works in the field of studying the built environment and uh, the history of cities, until we solve the problem of the train tracks in downtown Framingham, none of these conversations will make much of a difference at all. Um, and, and you said since the 1880s, and I think that's absolutely valid, if not before. <laughs> um, and so I think there really has to be, if this is about strategic long-term planning, it's not just 10 years, frankly, this is like a 50-year game plan. And there has to be an acknowledgement of the different types of modes of transportation. I think many of us, Framingham is a fairly auto-dependent community, especially in the more suburban aspects of it. And we have to own that and figure out ways to deal with that, but we can't cut off our nose to spite our face. And it will be much more successful for everybody if the train is dealt with in a really proactive, long-term way. And I think that's also something I hear so much coming through in the conversations that tend to happen in this city, that we're always behind the ball and we're somehow not at the table. And number one, I don't buy either of those two things, but I really wish we could even just change our self-talk about it, that we are leading the way about this and we see that there's new development coming and wouldn't it be great if we could do this? And that just feels better for everybody and it feels better when we um, share that with our community at large. So that's my, sorry, overly long um, skirt. Um, the other thing is that I think we have to acknowledge that Framingham is made up of different areas that are more suited to different types of transportation than others, just by the way they've evolved over a long period of time. That said, they have to be able to coexist, and I think that everybody likes to complain about traffic, and that's a big pain in the neck for sure. But I think there are different ways of solving that, and what I'd love to see the city provide some leadership on is not just about we need more lanes here or we need faster speed through here, but also where are the incentives that we can provide in our community for people not getting in their car and driving someplace? Could they walk to school if they live within walking distance because they might 
might have three or four families who could create a walking carpool, if you will, to go together? What are the ways that the school and the community could create opportunities for building community while also taking a couple of cars off the road that don't need to take that trip because they have a neighbor who they can walk with? And that connects to issues of neighborhood schools and proximity and busing and things like that too. Um, the, um, the last thing I would say is that, you know, we all like our cars and we drive places, but I think that we need to think more strategically about what other public transportation options we can provide, if that means expanded busing, but that also what incentives go with that, that get those of us who go into our single vehicles to go to X location to actually get into a shared vehicle. Um, and take one additional car off the road times infinite number of people, that's going to make the biggest difference in the long term is if some of us start to rethink if we need to get in the car every time and if there are, in fact, resources that allow that to not be a car trip or not to be a solo car trip. So some food for thought. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Caroline Levy. I live in District 5. And um, recently I noticed that on the Waze app, which is the app that many of us use um, to get directions, there's a little icon that says carpool. And if you choose that, you can choose to either be a driver or a passenger. And if you choose to be a driver and you select where you're going, um, the Waze app will tell you who is which stranger, I mean, it, it's kind of odd, but it's which stranger is going to be on your way and you can pick them up and it'll tell you if it's one minute out of your way or five minutes out of your way and then they also pay you. So there's the incentive. Um, so it takes, you know, takes um, more cars off the road and people get paid, so there's a little incentive. And there's a way, and I haven't looked into it yet, but um, we could organize our, our community to be part of this we could do a Framingham Community Ways. So if e even just doing local um, commuting or if people are going to Boston, they can use um, Ways for going into Boston and carpooling. And then the other thing is I would like to see is a, a frequent um, bus, a quick bus service um, from Framingham to South Station or North Station. It would be nice if there was, uh, you know, a bus service. I know that um, my my rep uh, Maria Robinson mentioned it when we were at that meeting about the Mass Pike um, construction project, and I think that would be a good idea to have. Um, there is a bus service at 12 o'clock, I think, from um, the Peter Pan, um, but it would be nice if there was um, more frequent buses, like Logan Express. I mean, ma many of us use Logan Express. So if there was um, something as frequent to go to downtown, maybe the North Station or South Station, that would help people who work in Cambridge. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. I think even a, a couple crosstown buses just here in Framingham would be a big improvement to get people off, off the streets and more cars off the streets. Um, and you see those in larger cities. As cities grow, they... Uh, have these interbus systems that that go in, uh, um, you know, just a couple regular schedules from the north side of Framingham to the south side, and then cross town as well. Uh, I think that would be um, something that we could, you know, look at and expand with our current bus system. Yes, Mr. Epstein. Okay, it's it's interesting to hear about the downtown rail traffic interaction. Because I remember when I, I grew up in Sydney, and Sydney has a really great uh, uh, rail system. It's got spokes that come out from the city and a ring rail around it. So you can go pretty much anywhere. I'd never seen a, a train interacting with traffic un un until I came here, except when you would drive 50 miles out of Sydney, you would find a, these railroad crossings and you'd have to stop and there would be a train. So it was really surprising to me to find that the rail system was not underground uh, here. But in Washington it is, for example, so people do this. So I think depressing the rail system is really critical generally to, to allow you to have speed. In Sydney, the, the time to get from where I live to the city was 10 minutes by train and an hour by car. Okay, so because they had through trains, they had multiple tracks and so on. So 
it's also surprising to look at this rail system here where there's this one track that seems to have an occasional train and when you look at the railway station, I didn't actually recognize it as a railway station at first because it like had a quarter of a, the platform from what I was used to where you have a whole platform at full height so si people can get off the train anywhere. Instead, it seems to be that you have to go to this tiny little place. So it's very, and also the train switches sides at some point in the day. So, which is amazing to me that that could happen. I thought there'd always be terrible collisions somewhere from that. But it's clear that that's a really important area to look at. And it would certainly change the whole dyna dynamic of downtown. Also, there's the CSX siding along Farm Pond, which that railroad is blocking pedestrian access from downtown to Farm Pond, which th if you imagine the railroad disappearing, which we don't want it to do, but if that part did, you could have a downtown that was budging, restaurants, all this kind of pedestrian stuff, and then you could go for a nice walk all around Farm Pond. So strategically, I think that's really important in terms of shifting the whole dynamic of downtown, because downtown is also very strange because there's a lot of buildings that are abandoned and you well know about this. They don't seem to have any purpose. And there's also a lot of churches all in the middle of the town, which is also strange. I never saw that before. Uh, but there's all this history that's been around for, you know, 100 years. But I see this as a, a larger scale version of high school air conditioning, which when they put the high school in, they never put the air conditioning in. They put everything in there except the air conditioning final units. And so it took 20 years for us and this current school committee, you finally said we're going to solve it because 95 degrees in the classroom is not acceptable. And also inability to use most of the building over the summer was not acceptable. But one can do it, but you have to have the resolve to do it. The other thing I would say is uh, it surprises me how we have pretty much no charging stations for any, anyone. There's one we're putting in, which is a big deal. My electrician says one of the most favorite things people putting in now are charging stations in their home. So they put in their home, but where are they driving to, to get them? I know in Brookline, because I used to live in Brookline, they have a charging station at, at uh, Town Hall. So I fully expected that we would have all these things here because many of the trips made by municipal folks in DPW are short trips. So if you had a charging station at DPW main building and City Hall, and also even to the schools, you'd be able to have a lot of short trip recharge when you get there situation. So that's a big opportunity. It ties into the next topic on sustainability. But the other thing I notice as I drive around, because I'm into Newton and Brookline probably every week or two, is bike lanes. There are bike lanes everywhere in uh, Brookline. And so, and there are bike racks full of these bikes that you can pay for. I don't know quite what the deal is. And they hold, uh, have these electric scooters everywhere. So this is something that many people have done elsewhere. And if I think of high schools, well, I mean, if the bike lanes were there and safe, we could solve maybe, and maybe even with electric scooters, we could solve the problem where we have big absenteeism in the high school right now. And one of the problems is they sleep in, they miss the bus, and that's it. And so we have no alternate way for them to get to school. Well, if we had bike lanes, of course, winter's another thing, but if you had bike lanes, they could actually ride to school, or if you had electric scooters, they could go even probably five times further in the time. So that's something that uh, is another case of, uh, it's been done elsewhere, and any recommendation from you folks on this whole area, and particularly comparing how other communities have done it and what capital costs there are, would be really useful, I think. Thank you. Anyone else? Traffic and transportation ideas? Maybe we institute a uh, cross-country ski share program in the winter <laughs> to get everyone to school. Uh, <laughs> yes. Hi, Caroline Levy, um, District 5. Did we, is there an opportunity to do a survey about what people would want, what, what they would need as far as transportation? Like people who live in the northwest corner of Framingham, like where are they going on a daily basis, and where where are people going? What are, what are their needs? Are they are every day are they going to soccer? Are they going to Merchant Field? Should we have a 
a bus that takes people from Knobscot to Merchant Field on Wednesdays, for example, in the springtime. Is there a survey that can be done? And if so, who, would, who do you think would be doing the survey? I, oh, Mr. Desolates. Uh, I'm assuming, and I don't know the answer to this, but I'm guessing that that question has been looked at, probably not in depth, but the city planning department would be a place to do that kind of work. I suspect that some of that work has probably been done in the past. Uh, Merck up at Framingham State does some of that kind of transportation analysis too, but I don't think there's ever been uh, w internal Framingham uh, survey kind of thing done. But that's the place where if it were to happen, it probably could, should happen, is the city planning department. I, I think that uh, survey idea is a great idea though. Um, and, and I agree, I think it's something that would it could shed a lot of light on the needs of Framingham. Do you have your hand up? Oh, oh. anyone else? Oh, Ms. McCarthy. Thank you. Kathy McCarthy, Precinct 10, District 6, and I apologize if you've already gone through this. I was at a housing meeting at the Coston Room. I was thinking you were over at City Hall, so then I was like, oh, I had to look it up. So, um, and unfortunately, I didn't sit up front, so this room echoes like crazy, and I couldn't hear a couple of the speakers. But in any case, um, this last comment about shuttling people to various activities and everything, uh, I think many of you were in town or the community through the uh, years we had the lip bus, before we had the regional bus. And that was the purpose of people shuttling around the city or the town at the time. It wasn't well uh, used for the things that was mentioned, mainly whether it be a stigma or whatever. But through the regional authority, uh, there may be other possibilities of other routes. But folks in Framingham should definitely look into the roots for these type of things and engage in use of the um, Metro West Regional Transportation because there are buses going all over the place. Um, you talk about transportation and housing. They think if you have more housing, you'll have less issues with traffic, but that's not gonna be true because we have lived it, we know it. The, uh, there's concern about having these areas where they say, now say smart growth, which we already knew was a smart growth in when we bought there near Route 9 uh, back what, close to 40 plus years ago. But now it's looked at, well, these people really don't exist. Even our representatives, city council and school committee voted for overlay districts. And when certain relating to these residential areas, and when I, as a past town meeting member representing these districts, this area, would go to the uh, meeting People were up in arms. Well, who did this without even reaching out to us? They did it because they didn't recognize there were viable, active neighborhoods in those areas, and that was a shameful thing to do. So we should make sure that the representatives that represent us in the future in these districts realized the integrity of the full district and all the aspects of that district and the implications of their votes against certain parts of that district with overlays. Because um, with the housing meeting, we talked about um, a bill that was coming forward and it would implicate a majority vote for certain overlay as opposed to a two third vote on, on zoning. That's very scary to some of us. But transportation, you talk about bike lanes and that, you see how many people come through Framingham um, 
difficulties are cut through or whatever, we should make sure that they're stopping in Framingham and helping our economic development and having it as a destination along the way. And so whatever we can do in that regard would be helpful to us. Um, because a lot of people, you know, that whole thing, work, play, I forget the, the four tenets of it. And um, we should make sure that we are, we, I think we are having a very diverse housing market in Framingham, but we have to be careful and not get back into where we were in the 70s when Route 9 was developed and no transportation, no sidewalks from all those apartments on the westbound, uh, eastbound lane of the west part of Route 9. Uh, they're kind of in an island there and there's no way of folks other than getting in a vehicle or a cab or a lift or whatever to get to the store in that. And it's un very unfortunate that it wasn't forward thinking. So when we develop, we need to make sure of what are the needs of the people there? Where are they going to shop? Where are they going to go to school? All these things and the entertainment that we might have here. When we came to Framingham, there was a variety of big name entertainment and um, you know, the old Chateau de Ville, you get shows, big names and everything else, it was a draw. So let's think of the ways that we can be that draw in a good way and um, like think of the full family, the full people together. Um, also, when you add more housing uh, to the extreme that we tend to be doing and the governor wants to do in the future, um, you have to think of the infrastructure, the water and sewer that was mentioned, but also public safety. And the problems with uh, not having enough people to go around, I mean, you have Wonder, uh, wonderful people being school resources offices that are in the schools and helping to figure out what would happen before it happens and being the friend and the uh, person to talk to in the schools. But those are also people that may be not um, in on the road and being um, able to service all these people that are inclusive and, and coming on board with all this new building. So we have to keep an eye on the whole picture. People talk about water and sewer rights, the taxes, but there's a lot of things that go into not just the building and filling the building, but we don't have enough affordable units and it doesn't seem like we're doing anything to make sure that we do get more. And accessibility is a major problem. We have come a long way in this city, but we have a long way to go. And I don't know if it's already been mentioned, but that has to be a priority in anything we do. Accessibility for all, integration to all personnel, all needs of our community, because that's who we are. And we should be proud we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I think that, um, uh, and just as a, an aside, I know the city of Boston, and not that we are anywhere near the, the same size, but they're kind of going through some of those same growing pains with the Seaport District. Uh, a lot of people moved in there very quickly, and their city council now is having to scramble to say, hey, we need a fire department station down there. We might need a library and a police substation down there. So it is definitely something, I appreciate those comments because it's something that we have to keep in mind as Framingham continues to grow and, and get larger. Um, I think that that's something that we uh, definitely should consider uh, looking at in the future and what that might look like. Uh, so I know Mr. Stoat is, r <laughs> is chomping at the bit. We will get to the topic of environmental and sustainability now. Um, so uh, just to, to kick us off, um, you know, uh, people talk about putting solar panels on municipal buildings. Uh, we have a number of uh, uh, locations uh, for some uh, environmental justice 
issues on the south side of town uh, and some environmental cleanup that, that needs to be done. Uh, recycling is still a, a large issue for us as we uh, uh, come to grips with uh, uh, other countries not wanting to accept our recycling as they have in the past and the cost associated with that. So that's all things that we have to, to, uh, to look at. Um, Mr. Stowe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to say your, your uh, mandate is for 10 years, is that correct? That is the uh, mandate in the charter for the strategic plan. Okay. The interesting thing about that is the UN's IPCC gives us 11 years plus. So you, the mandate on your planning will run out a year before we run into a crisis if we do not respond. And I want to say that, uh, just to make you jealous, I was in London and I got on a train that went 339 kilometers an hour and we were in Paris without ever having to spill our drink while we were on the train. So the, also tomorrow at 10 a.m. there is a, a hearing at the State House on the governor's transportation plan of over a billion dollars of bonding. So the, my point of this is we need to understand and look at where the problems are. Our transportation problems are not going to be solved by Framingham. We're not the only town that has traffic problems. They're going to be solved by the government, the state government and the federal government stepping up to the plate and actually making public transportation available. And by planning boards in cities like ours actually planning to put jobs somewhere near their people's residences. And when we do our re, uh, rebuilding and remodeling of our public housing, we probably should consider putting solar panels or geothermal on them because 10 years is not a long time. I have a three-year-old grandson and a five-year-old granddaughter, and they're going to be right in the middle of this mess. And I have to say that I have not seen the, the, uh, the uh, ur sense of urgency get into our city or into our city, our state government, or our federal government. I mean, uh, I would ask all of you to go home and YouTube Greta Thunberg and listen to the young Swedish lady talk about how desperate this crisis really is that we're not paying attention to. There should be no public buildings in this city that doesn't uh, has some form of alternate engineer, uh, alternate energy. There should be no building in this city that is. Uh, it's, being put up without the ability to uh, have a green roof or geothermal or, or solar systems. We should be f pressing our state and our, to put bus systems in here that actually function. I mean, I live on Belknap Road. The, uh, using a bus on Belknap Road, you, you risk your life if you walk for an, a mile one way or the other. It doesn't matter which direction it is, but there's no bus stop at either end of it, yet there's over a thousand cars that run down that road every day. So I beg you to get, uh, to express the sense of urgency of what we're having happen here. We really have to get on the ball fast because it is uh, well known that this is a problem that is only going to accel accelerate. And everything that we do to block it makes it a little less of a problem or it gives us a little longer time to solve it. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, anybody want to make, come in? Sure. Larry, it's a question for you. I, I long admire your advocacy in this. What would, what would you say are the top five things, I'm going to give you five, that Framingham needs to do, if you could do that in a couple of minutes. Where would you, what would you think the top like, steps are to get us to help fight this? First of all, the first thing I would do is mandate that every public building in this city has some form of renewable energy and some form of system to control the amount of energy that's being used in that building. It strikes me as absolutely uh, nuts that we have schools that function most of the time in daylight and we don't have solar panels on them and we're pumping electricity and energy into those buildings. Uh, we mentioned putting... Uh, air conditioning on top of the school. I find the interesting thing is, is the air conditioning is actually uh, a problem because we air con the higher it gets, the more air conditioners we put in, the more electricity we generate to fight the heat while we build more air conditioners. It's a, it's a vicious circle and it's like a lot of other things. The other thing I would do is I would immediately ask our city government to force 
our the state legislators and the legislation to put some big money into public transportation. It would be nice to sink the railroad, but I don't think that's going. By the way, I went under the English Channel, so it can be done. <laughs> so that's two things. Another thing is, is I would require that every uh, school in this uh, city teach children what is really happening with their environment because they are going to inherit uh, all the f generations before them's errors. So the outreach to the community on the issues, because I don't think most citizens in Framingham really understand what the problem is. And I think that's unfortunate, but I don't really think they understand the depth of it. And there is partially because there have been a major campaign to prevent people from understanding what's really happening. But the other thing is to deal with our water problems. We, we need to be more, uh, more responsible in our use of water because we are going to rapidly get to the point where we are going to overtax our water resources. And that, uh, like the Sioux at, uh, in Dakota said, w water is life. And lastly, the thing I would really like to see us do is to sit down amongst ourselves and discuss with everybody how they perceive their role in solving this problem. Was that five? <laughs> that was five. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, please. Tim Brainerd of Precinct One. This was in support of what Larry was saying. In my mind, there has to be a clear understanding the difference between trying to fix the problem and trying to remediate. Unfortunately, in this state, finally there's $10 billion in bonding to help remediate the problem. Very little is being done to cure the problem. Um, about 25 plus years ago, there was a campaign statement, it's the economy, stupid. No, right now it's the carbon. So the alternative energies that are available to the municipality, to businesses, big and small, to homeowners and to residents who rent. Most of the renters cannot get solar panels. So there is access through group purchasing that is a very simple fix. Um, when Larry mentions about the schools having solar panels, there's parking lots that can get solar panels. Um, we could have our own stretch code for energy, for building code, that would be better than the current state minimum building code that would say anytime you open up a site, consider it for geothermal. Consider that, driving, that parking lots and driveways be permeable. We're being, as a city, we're being whacked with increasing um, amounts of rain in short periods of time, heavier rainstorms. And the DPW is having to deal with that, plus to, uh, working under a mandate to do more to control it. But dealing with wetlands, dealing with dry wells and th things, that will save the, the town, a city, money. It'll also keep by saving money, we leaves us more for the other important priorities. So it's the carbon, silly. And do what you can to shift to anything that, get away from anything that deals with carbon, gas, oil, propane, heating oil, wood chips. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Anyone? Oh. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Larry. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. You had education. We just addressed that, teaching and putting public safety. This uh, climate crisis is a public safety crisis. How many people have heard of triple E? Mm -hmm. And the expansion of Lyme disease are based on the fact that our winters are not cold enough to kill off the, the uh, parasites. So as we continue to heat the place up, I, I have a dead oak out in front of my house. It died. We had a drought. Two years later, we had an infestation of gypsy moths. It's killed probably an 80, 90-year-old oak. 
I got another one on my property that's struggling. I don't know if it's going to make it. Uh, I heard the uh, uh, Framingham is not planting any white pines anymore because the juvenile white pines don't do well with this temperature. So there are immediate implications and immediate results from the climate crisis we're in now. Just figure out what happens when we jump another five or six degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Amy Puelka here. Thanks, Larry, Tim, for your comments and your passion. Um, the three of us and several others are all members of a group called Sustainable Framingham. And our, we are a group of citizens who are working together to improve environmental sustainability and reduce energy consumption in Framingham. And we would like the CIFOC to address climate change as a top priority, as, as Larry and Tim have passionately argued. Um, so I have a few prepared notes and then some ad hoc thoughts. Uh, addressing climate change is not a standalone issue, but a complex set of interactions within the municipal systems we have today. As Larry pointed out, it's transportation, it's public safety, it's education, it's every system we have. Every capital and operational expenditure has impacts on both our municipal budget and the climate. Um, for example, there was referred to earlier in our education segment that we had deferred maintenance on our school bu buildings. That deferred maintenance led us to the decision not to put solar on our school roofs because the roofs wouldn't support it. Other neighboring communities found the money to replace those roofs, put solar on, and they've been saving a lot of money through incentives and grant programs and the solar, the solar programs through the state. I want Framingham to be a leader in climate change. We voted at town meeting to be, become carbon neutral. Um, there are significant new opportunities for us to participate in. Uh, Tim mentioned the Speaker DeLeo's Greenworks Infrastructure Program. We're prepared to participate in that program. I know the planning department underwent the, the pre-requirements for that. Um, but what I have not heard is that um, little discussion of how our municipal efforts really intersect. Things we're talking about like the stormwater initiative and resilience programs, they're a natural fit. I haven't heard public discussion of those two things together, looking at the big picture. So um, if you had asked me the five things, I second Larry's votes. Um, I also, the community solar, solar for everyone, that's something that Sustainable Framingham is working on, that Sean Liz, the sustainability coordinator, is working on. That's a big piece. Um, public education and outreach and acting as resources for the city and city council. Um, and talking to various people over the last couple months, I'm surprised by how little thought or awareness people have of this issue. And um, it's out there. There's, it's an issue, right? Like people, people know that. But really in terms of what it means in terms of uh, public projects, very little thought has gone into it. I would like to see that change with either a plan through all of you, with the mayor's 10-year plan, or perhaps the establishment of a new climate and sustainability committee to act as resources for folks in city government and city council. Um, that would be a piece. The city can go out to bid for on behalf of all its residents and small businesses for electricity. Newton just did this, and if, if I'm remembering correctly, they got 60, 65% renewable energy at a cost similar to or perhaps even lower than the other, than the, the old rate, the old lesser renewable energy percentage, which is I think 13% right now. Um, so there's a lot of work we can be done. Um, I'd like to, to offer that Sustainable Framingham as a resource. If anyone has questions, we're happy to, to chat with you or email. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else have comments? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm Novel Alexander. I'm on the school committee and also um, a District 5 resident. And I'll be talking on behalf of myself. Um, so I'd like to just know real quickly, I know we're short of time, but um, I'd like to know how the committee feels about uh, a temporary moratorium on new apartments here in Framingham. Um, and this, I guess, goes to, um, it's kind of a cross-cutting issue, obviously, because 
um, we've all sat here today, tonight, talking about um, all the um, you know subjects of education, public safety, and transportation, and, and environment. So um, obviously, these um, new residences can bring both good and challenging, um, or significant significant challenges for Framingham. Uh, and from what I understand, there's roughly 2,000 apartments that are slated to come online in next year. So. Um, as many others here has alluded to, that um, how is that going to impact all of our um, all the topics that we've discussed tonight? So um, I'd just like to get um, your feelings on all that. Thanks. Anyone? So I don't know if it's our place to to basically issue a moratorium or have an opinion. Uh, we can certainly we can certainly put together our guidance, but it really is up to the mayor and the city council to follow, you know, what what we would recommend. It's a double-edged sword. I live I live right near the Knobscot Plaza that's been vacant since I moved in, and unless she, unless something is done there, it's going to stay vacant as a blight. On the on the flip side, bringing in more density brings in all the all the things. Can we absorb that many kids in the school? Traffic. You know all the things that come with more density, so I don't think it's something that's as simple as issue a moratorium and the problem goes away. I think it's something that we have to look at: is uh, how are we going to evolve as a city? How are we going to provide services for those? You know, for those units. Uh, it's also you have to remember, unless the city issues a moratorium, which may or may not, you know, be challenged in court. Um, these are still private enterprise that are doing some of this development. It, you know, it's not on city land. So there is an aspect of free enterprise to this as well. I think people sometimes forget that. So our job is to collect all the facts, you know, get the opinions, get the wants, get the needs, digest it, and come up with a recommendation that we then pass on to the mayor. So I'm happy to give you my personal opinion but I don't think I speak for the group, and I don't know if the group has actually come together to say this is our position on it. I don't know if you'd agree or disagree, but. N no, we, we haven't come to an official position on that. I just, I just want uh, Jerry oh, has sorry. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, the previous speaker is correct. I mean, we're not a body that is the body politic that makes decisions on these things. However, it relates back to an earlier point I raised about the city planning department, the mayor's office, the city council reviewing its own ordinances and those kinds of issues. Is there an appropriate analysis that has been done before the decisions have been made on the building of these thousands of apartments? I think the answer to that is no. So the question is for all of us, and I think we'll bring this to the city council, the mayor, and the school department as well, is we need to do our homework. We need to do better planning. We need to be strategic in the way we look at the development and growth of residential properties, including apartments in our community. Whether or not uh, a moratorium is a temporary measure that city council and the mayor could take to look at this question, that's for them to determine. Uh, what's more important to me is they look at the long-term issue from the perspective that I just discussed, which is let's be thoughtful about the way we plan these things. We can't just, I think with the Framingham should not just go forward approving all of the stuff in a vacuum. I think we need to be thoughtful and planful in our thinking about further development of residential properties in Framingham. All I just wanted to say is I read your piece this morning, Mr. Alexander, and uh, just to point out that I think where it lies with the strategic planning is that the city of Marlboro, I believe you pointed out in your piece, uh, did take a six-month break, I think it was, to just kind of take and assess where that fit with their long-term planning. So a moratorium isn't completely out of the realm for other municipalities, as you pointed out, um, but it it is something maybe we, we could put, it, we'll discuss further, but it's not a place for us to have an opinion about that. But um, I did read your piece this morning, and I, I think your thoughts are very interesting when it comes to long-term planning, so. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Epstein? Epstein, sorry. <laughs> no, I decided at some point in my life was Epstein and not Epstein. <laughs> but not everybody respects that. So I'm emotionally on the same page as Larry because, uh, I, you know, I'm at the, in the last third of my life, 
you know, hopefully I'll have a, a fair amount still to go. Can you get to Sorry, I'll have a fair amount still to go, but it's amazing to me the lack of resolve on this issue. Uh, what's also amazing is when I moved to Framingham in 2014, in the next year I saw all the Amoresco panels go up on the um, turnpike. So I thought it was time for me to look into that. Okay, and I looked into it. And so I got solar, I'm talking as a resident here, not as Cookerby member. Mm -hmm. I got Solar City in and I found if I went their route and I leased my roof to them, I'd make $100 profit a month from doing that. And then I got Sunbug Solar from Somerville in and I found that if I bought the uh, installation, I'd make $200 a month. So I did that. So I got them in. I got 37 solar panels on my roof. They came in, reinforced my roof to make sure it would, would work. Four years ago, that system went into operation. Now, what were the numbers on that? Well, we were frankly shocked when we found out how much it would be. It was going to be $56,000 to put 37 solar panels on our house. And my wife and I said, we don't have that money. But then we figured out the whole picture because it all comes down to arithmetic. So we had to, in the end, put up $6,000, which we could take out of our equity line. But that was capital. We got $18,000 tax credit from the federal government. We got $1,000 from the Massachusetts government. And we got a low interest loan from DCU for the rest. We generated electricity. We saved money because of that. And the state paid us in addition for doing it. Every megawatt I generate, they give me money. So the net result was that we made $2,500 a year. We would put up $6,000. So we got a 40% return on investment on that, which is pretty good. I couldn't understand for the life of me why everyone didn't do this in Framingham. And I think it was an informational gap problem because there's lots of people here could, who have sunny roofs and could have uh, you know, five or $6,000 to put down because after all, in two and a half years, you'd make it back. So I think one of the problems is the city slash town never informed its uh, residents they could make a lot of money out of their sunny roofs. So there's a big information problem. The, the second thing is we have Amoresco living here in Framingham, one of the biggest solar installation companies in, in the states, certainly within Massachusetts. It's amazing that we have no solar panels on any municipal building that I can see, certainly not in the schools. We're way behind on that. So there are a number of comments that are relevant to that. And that is every time we have a budget cycle, I've observed it more closely in the last couple of years, it always appears as if we have no money. And then at the end of the year, often we generate these really big surpluses. I think a couple of years ago, it was $16 million. And so we have this penny-pinching approach at budget time that makes it look like we can't invest in anything. And I talked to a town meeting member of some experience with this and he said, over the last 10 years, there have been so many green energy opportunities lost because we never actually put the capital together to be able to go in with the state on these things. And we have a billion dollars of state money coming up. Okay, so there's a big opportunity here to look at this as an investment. It's not just, oh, we can't find that money. The question is, what are we going to get as a return on the money? And so that's a really important thing to change in the city culture is an investment strategy mm -hmm. rather than we can't afford it strategy. So maybe we have to tax the two and a half percent to get the capital that we need to do this at the same time as we protect the low income people by raising their uh, you know, tax deferral uh, ability. But there are lots of people, in fact, the 60 million of tax relief that went to property owners, most of it didn't go to low income people. Most of it went to the well-off people because they're the ones who had the most expensive houses and so on. So that's one thing. So the result from the little allegory about my house is we should do the same for all municipal buildings. And that is every school. I mean, I look at neighboring Natick and I look at Newton and there are solar panels on all these. I look at Ashland High and there's a solar parking lot. I look at Lincoln Sudbury and there's a solar parking lot. And yeah, more, it's, it's endless. And I look at us in the school department now, t speaking as a school committee member, we're about to redo the entire Brophy School parking lot for stormwater. So we're going to put a huge amount of money, almost a million dollars into that, to fix the stormwater. 
but why don't we put a solar parking lot on there at the same time? The question is, someone needs to run the math on this and say, what investment do we have to put up and what return will we get for Brophy and for Fuller for every school, for every parking lot, for every roof? So I think that's something that the CIFOC can do is run the numbers on that. So roofs and parking lots, and also looking into getting rid of gasoline-powered everything. Because, I mean, I agree, we did put uh, air conditioning in the high school, but at least it's electric, and at least it just runs two months a year. Okay, but I know that my furnace runs on uh, natural gas, and that's a problem. In fact, everybody's heating seems to run off that. But cars, we know there's an alternative. And even as simple as everywhere there's gasoline, you look at all the, the landscaping equipment, the gasoline-powered leaf blower, the gasoline-powered this and that and the other, lawn mowers. It's something where we can appeal to residents at least is get rid of your gas-powered equipment, stick a power outlet on your house. And even if you have a landscaper come past, get them to use an electric uh, uh, um, machine. Okay, so that's one thing that you can do because we have to have all hands on deck on this because uh, it just cannot be by half measures. So the other thing is municipal aggregation. Yes, I used to live in Newton and yes, they did go out and they got using the buy, buying power of the city negotiated to get a municipal agreement to get a company to supply electricity using Eversource's network and it is, you can choose as a property owner in Newton, 60% renewal, renewable, which is less than the Eversource standard rate right now. And it's agreement for two years, so it's not forever, but that shows you where the price point is. And you can also choose 100% green. So you give your residents an opportunity to do something about it, okay? Within the school committee, now talking as a school committee member, I am chair of the finance subcommittee, and so one of the things we're wanting to look at, and I've raised it to Lincoln Lynch and this subcommittee, is what do we stand to win if we got municipal aggregation for our electric costs, okay? What do we stand to win if we put solar on every roof and in every parking lot? So we're gonna drive it through our end of things, but it seems to me that CIFOC has the resources and ability to get the numbers on all these things for every building and parking lot and look at all of the municipal fleet and turn it electric, and what does that cost? So that's, and all of the incentives are coming from the state. So there's money there, like my $18,000 tax credit from the federal government, there's a billion dollars of money coming from the state. They just uh, mm -hmm. have put that together. So there's a lot of incentives, and we need to be, as they say, shovel ready. When the Obama shovel ready pro projects came around, if you were ready to go, you got the money. If you weren't ready to go, you didn't. So that's another thing. I've got a couple more things Thank you. Here. Well, we're about 12 minutes over where we I need to be. Can you, can you submit that in writing to the committee, please? Just two minutes. Electric buses for the schools. Okay. Trash fee, uh, okay. like they have in Brookline, and planting trees in the city. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are 12 minutes. Do you ha I'll give you five seconds. <laughs> we are way over time, and the school department has been generous in, in donating this space to us, so we don't want to abuse the, the workers. I taught Epi how to talk. And he talked, Great. A, he talked up a storm. I just want you to go capture all this yep. and then think about uh, when we had issues with an, an air environmental problems, land environmental problems, and water, and, and we weren't out in front of it. We were behind it, and it took efforts like Judy Grove and her neighbors to do something about uh, Irving Street and Mary Dennison and a bunch of other things. And I think what these people are saying is we got to get out in front of it, which was going back to what was talked about on the 23rd, which was government services. And maybe we need to break out a, a section of city government that deals with these kind of issues, uh, something called real city planning, and keep them away from the day-to-day -day stuff that people are immersed with because they can't really separate the day-to-day -day from what we should be looking at over time, and over time is what you folks are about. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, our next meeting uh, for the SciFoc, the meetings for SciFoc are always open. We meet every two weeks, uh, so you can find our agendas and our time schedules on, on the city website and the public meeting uh, portal. Uh, but thank you so much for coming. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Second? All right, all in favor? Aye, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>